once you become fearless life becomes limitless hi friends welcome to my channel physio note so we are discussing about the topic spinal cord injury so it is the last part and here we are going to discussing about the physiotherapy management of spinal cord injury so first of all we have to discuss about the physiotherapy management at the acute stage of recovery so during this time during the acute stage the patient is immobilized in spasm with the help of some special type of orthosis uh, depending upon the site of injury if it is injury is at the cervical level then we are using halos or minerva type of uh, orthosis and if it is at the lumbar region or thoracic region then we are using thoracolumbar orthosis and the patient is in bed rest during the acute stage so what is the main goal of the physiotherapy that is we have to prevent the secondary complication we have to educate the patient and we have to begin the early mobilization as soon as possible then we have to go for that is what are the things that should be examined that is before planning or before implementing the treatment we have to thoroughly assess the patient so first of all we have to check for the motor and sensory function of the patient about the respiratory function of the patient and its integumentary function then muscular strength muscle tone uh, reflex activity then passive range of motion cardiac function and early mobility skills these are the things that should be assessed before we are giving to a giving treatment to a patient in acute stage then this about the physical therapy intervention so acute care management uh, the main uh, goals of the acute care management is we are already discussed that we have to reduce the secondary complication and we have to improve the respiratory function of the patient okay so these are the two important goals in the acute stage of recovery so first my first thing that is we have to give is the respiratory management that is we have to improve the respiratory status of the patient because the patient is in bed rest so there is a chance of getting accumulation of the secretion in the lungs as well as um some abnormal breathing pattern also there so we have to regain its respiratory function we have to normalize the respiratory function so main goal of this respiratory management is we have to improve the ventilation we have to increase the effectiveness of cuff and also we have to prevent the chest tightness and ineffective substitute breathing patterns so what are the means so first we starting with the deep breathing exercise in the deep breathing exercise diaphragmatic breathing exercise should be encouraged because it will facilitate the diaphragmatic movement and that will increase the vital capacity so we have to encourage the diaphragmatic breathing exercise second one is glossopharyngeal breathing so this glossopharyngeal breathing is useful in patient with a high level cervical lesion okay who are dependent on a mechanical ventilator or a patient with a mid to high level uh, cervical injury who are not dependent on a mechanical ventilator so here what the patient is instructed to take a small amount of air in a gulping pattern and uh, he, he is uh, tell to repeat this procedure to 6 to 10 times so by using this technique enough air is gradually inspired and expiration occurs as a result of the elastic recoil of lungs so it is a very effective method then uh, next one is uh, air shift maneuver so air shift maneuver this technique provide the patient with an independent method of chest expansion so it involves the close uh, closing the glottis after a maximum inhalation that will relax the diaphragm and allows the air that will shift from the lower thorax to the upper thorax and that will maintain and uh, maintain the um, air and also it increases the chest wall expansion and what happened is due to this uh, uh this air shift maneuver the patient may, may be hyperventilate there will be excessive of air will get into the lungs so the therapist should be continually monitoring the patient if there is any symptoms of dizziness or other signs okay so he have to monitor the patient thoroughly then uh, we will go for respiratory muscular strengthening that is mainly uh, done by an inexpensive handheld devices that is inspiratory uh, devices it can be of two types either a resistive devices or a threshold trainer so by using this devices that will increase as the resistive or threshold inspiratory role on the muscle and that will helps to improve the pulmonary function it will reduces the dyspnea and also it improve the cuff function then we are going to the um, so these are uh, this is the respiratory inspiratory device okay it is a inspiratory device that is mainly used to strengthen the inspiratory muscle okay 
So next method is cuffing. So we have to give a cuffing, assistive cuffing techniques to the patient. That is the patient who are not able to produce a functional cuff. He should be taught to perform a self-assisted cuff. And those who cannot perform a self-assisted cuff, they may be benefited manual assisted cuff to help to remove the secretion. So we have to uh, therapist give a quickly an inward and upward direction as the patient attempts to cuff. So we can see in this picture, the first picture shows that uh, it is a self-assisted type of cuff, cuffing technique and in the second picture shows the manual assisted cuffing technique that is mainly giving the abdominal thrust. Okay. Then next is abdominal binder. So this abdominal binder may improve the respiratory function and cuffing ability of a patient in with thoracic and cervical lesion. So that the binder will compress the abdominal contents to increase the intra-abdominal pressure and that should be elevate the diaphragm and there will be more optimal position of breathing. So it will helps to maintain the intra-thoracic pressure and decreasing the postural hypertension. Then chest wall stretching that is spasticity and muscle tightness within the chest wall may develop. So we have to give for manual chest wall stretching and that should be indicated to increase the chest expansion. Okay and it is contraindicated in a case with the rib fracture. So next one is skin care. So prevention is the most effective intervention for skin care that entails a positioning, consistent and effective pressure relief and skin inspection and education. So areas that are susceptible to skin breakdown should be adequately protected when the patient is in a bed by using pillows, forms and positioning devices. And the positioning should, be, uh, should also be used to prevent the development of joint contractures and secondary pulmonary complication. Okay, for example, a patient with a C5 level injury may tend to position the shoulder in abduction and elbow in flexion. So, when positioning the patient, the shoulder should be in abducted and the elbow extended when possible. And it, that uh, the patient should be repositioned at least every two hours. A variety of special beds, mattresses and other overlays can assist in prevention for skin breakdown such as water bed, air bed, foam cushions etc. And the wheelchair seating system should also assist in promoting optimal positioning for reducing pressure etc. So a tilt in space reclining wheelchair can be used so it can be uh, it can adjust in various angles so that will uh, redistribute the pressure areas and prevent the secondary complication okay Then early strengthening and range of motion. Early strengthening and range of motion shows that range of motion exercise should be completed daily except in those areas that are contraindicated or require selective stretching. So in the early stage of recovery, the range of motion or strengthening exercise that are too intense may be placed increased pressure and stress on the vertebral sides or a fracture vertebral sides. So that will again cause us some problems. So what happened is the motion of the trunk and some motions of the hip may be contraindicated depending upon the location of the spinal cord injury. That is if the injury is at the lumbar spine, straight leg raise more than 60 degree and hip flexion beyond 90 degrees should be avoided and with the tetraplegia the motion of head and neck should is contraindicated is contraindicated pending orthopedic clearance. So extreme caution should be used when stretching the shoulders. Generally the shoulder flexion and abduction beyond 90 degrees is contraindicated until orthopedic clearance is received. Indicate the spine is fully healed and stable. And the patient with a spinal cord injury do not require full range of motion in all joints. Okay, it is the main very important thing that we have to consider. It does not require full range of motion in all joints. But some, uh, some joints may be beneficial and some joints may cause something, some problematic things. Okay, that is some joints beneficial from, from allowing tightness to develop in certain muscle to enhance the function. For example, in tetraplegia, tightness of this lower trunk musculature may increase as a sitting posture. Okay. But conversely, some muscle requires a full uh, lengthened range. That is, after the acute phase, the hamstring will require a stretching. And that will as achieving a straight leg raise of approximately 100 degrees. Okay. Then we have to uh, give an intrinsic plus splint in a, which is used to position the wrist uh, metacarpophalangeal joint, interphalangeal joints and thumb to maintain the joints in optimal intrinsic plus position. 
then early mobility intervention early mobility intervention mainly uh, discussing about the uh, that is once the fracture is stabilized the patient should be cleared for upright functional activities that is with the help of a tilt table it should be uh, the patient should be get to the upright position and after the fracture is stabilization we can give some bed mobility exercise also okay then we are going for the active rehabilitation so before again before giving any physiotherapy intervention we have to first we have to do the physiotherapy examination that is here mainly we have to uh, examine the aerobic capacity and endurance it is mainly done by an uh, six minute arm walk test arm test then arousal attention cognition is mainly done by mini mental status of examination then environmental or work barriers gait locomotion and balance then again a motor function muscular performance uh, muscle performance um, pain then uh, work community lesion integration and reintegration it should be assessed okay before planning a treatment then what are the intervention that we can give first one it is a strengthening exercise so here the strengthening exercise key upper extremity strengthen uh, key upper extremity muscles are strengthening that is mainly the serratus anterior latissimus dorsi pectoralis major rotator cuff muscle and triceps brachii so these are the muscles which are very very important for the independent transfers and the strengthening exercise should be done uh, two to four times a week and performing two to three sets of eight to twelve repetition at sixty to eighty percentage of one repetition maximum. Okay, and uh, it can be done using uh, pulley systems, free weights, elastic bands, weight cuffs, dumbbells, etc. Okay, and if the muscle grade is less than two, that strengthening can be done by using a reeducational board. Then next uh, is cardiovascular or endurance training. Here the upper extremity based exercise such as arm ergometer, wheelchair propulsion and swinging are most common method we can use in aerobic training. And in spinal cord injury patients with the walking capacity, a treadmill training with or without body weight system can be used. And functional electrical stimulation induced cycling or walking, it can also improve cardiovascular fitness. And endurance training should be done for 3 to 5 days a week for 20 to 60 minutes at 50 to 80 peak heart rate. Then bed mobility skills. So this bed mobility skills will improve or promote the independence of functional mobility. And that uh, bed mobility skills mainly include the rolling, transitioning supine to or from, sitting on the edge of the bed and lower extremity management. So it is the main thing that we have to concentrate the bed mobility exercise. So uh, there will be rolling and there will be transitioning supine to fr supine to or from sitting that is it includes prone on elbow supine on elbow then walking on the elbow to assume long sitting and then coming straight to long sitting from supine so these are the main things that we have to consider so uh, so in this picture we can see that the patient is ready to go for road so the patient is start with the arm swinging and then he uh, with the help of the arm swinging the, he comes to the sight line that he gets rolled and the second picture shows that that from the lying to sitting that is the patient I first come to the sight line then uh, he put his weight on the elbow and then he slowly rise slowly rise by putting this weight on the hand okay then slowly he comes to sitting position so he, we can you can see in this picture then uh, next thing that is mainly we have to uh, concentrating about the sitting balance okay sitting balance the patient should be um, should be taught in both short sitting as well as long sitting that is independent sitting balance both in short sitting and long sitting is an important skill for many different functional tasks such as transverse dressing and wheelchair mobility and um, this sitting posture will vary considerably according to the level of injury the patient with for example patient with low thoracic lesion uh, can be ex ex expected to sit with a relatively erect trunk but uh, individually with uh, individual with a low cervical and high thoracic lesion that will maintain the sitting balance by forward head displacement and trunk flexion so these are the difference so we have to train the patient for sitting balance because sitting balance is very very important to to do the functional activities okay so we have to first of all we have to make the patient sit comfortably and we have to uh, go for a weight bearing that is weight transference from one side to other and we have to give some perturbation forces to the patient and after that we have to um, 
give dual tasking with the sitting position that should be uh, what that should be progress according to the patient condition then next one it is the wheelchair activities wheelchair activities that is mainly the transverse that is we have to transfer the patient from the bed to the wheelchair or wheelchair to bed then again wheelchair to toilet and toilet to wheelchair then wheelchair to vehicle that is particularly a car then a locomotion a locomotor training locomotor training that it can be divided into that is regulating the uh, regaining the ability to walk is a common goal for the most individual following a spinal cord injury so the patient must possess adequate muscle strength postural alignment range of motion and sufficient cardiovascular endurance to become functionally ambulation so walking with orthosis orthosis and assistive devices is slower and requires considerably more energy than walking before the injury so many individuals with a motor uh, motor complete spinal cord injury who learn to walk with these devices may not continue walking once they stop rehabilitation and the patient with motor incomplete spinal cord injury and more likely to regain functional ambulation skills than those with complete or sensory incomplete injury so it can be done with two things that is we can give by using a uh, angle uh, that is hip knee angle foot orthosis by using this we can give this mobility aids such as walker crutches etc okay that then we can start uh, then we can teach the patient to how to uh, locum or how to move from one place to another place okay so first we have that is uh, here mainly we are using swing through and a four point gait are used with the help of this hip knee angle foot orthosis okay hip knee angle foot orthosis we are um, mainly giving this um, swing through and uh, four point gait okay so we have to uh, we have to uh, give adequate training for the patient uh, to walk with this um, assistive aids like walker and crutches okay and another type of locomotive training is that is using a treadmill uh, using a body weight support we are walking on a treadmill it is another type of uh, locomotor um, training that is by using this body weight support that uh, the patient is able to provide and a patient is able to get some feedback about that um, walking like activities okay then uh, activity based upper extremity training so what do you mean by this activity based upper extremity training that is for a people with cervical spinal cord injury the recovery of upper extremity function is the primary goal okay so intervention is aimed at improving the functional use of upper extremity uh, have a primarily been compensatory in nature that is first of all we have to give this uh, upper extremity activity for 2 hours per day uh, for a 3 uh, weeks okay for a 3 weeks and we have to give apply a sensory electrical stimulation to the volar surface of the wrist or we can give some activities like uh, finger isolation uh, grasp grasp with the rotation pinch and pinch with the rotation so this finger isolation activity mainly includes a typing on a keyboard then uh, dialing a phone number playing piano notes etc then grasp activity include squeezing a ball or spray bottle cutting paper with scissors building uh, with legos etc then grasp with rotation which include a pouring liquid from one container to another container then pinching activity include picking up the objects then threading a large needle writing etc and pinch with rotation that include screwing nuts or bolt locking and unlocking a lock with the key etc then turning the knob dome etc so this is the activity based upper extremity training that is we have to train the patient uh train the upper extremity to do the functional activities so uh, these are the pictures that is mainly uh, showing the what mainly showing the uh, transferring that is the patient is transferring from the wheelchair to the bed okay that is i think that you can clearly see in this picture that is patient is uh, transferring from uh, wheelchair to bed okay so this is the one uh, picture depiction of the transfer so so this is the end of slide so uh, this is the end of the spinal cord injury topic and if you have any doubt let me know in my comment box okay and if you like my channel please support please like and please subscribe my channel thank you